so happy to be presenting here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, before I launch into the presentation, a few important details. Uh, on the left, you see the We Animals Archive. I want you all to um, remember this website. It's weanimalsarchive.org. This is the website where I make all of my images available for free to anyone helping animals. Uh, the images have been used by hundreds of people, academics, organizations, protesters around the world now. Uh, it's a really good resource. There are images from from uh, about 50 countries now over the last 15 years of my work. So please use this. Uh, if you're interested in speaking with me about humane education programs, I'm in schools giving age-appropriate talks uh, all over the place. And so that website is humaneeducation.ca. Uh, we're passing around a newsletter. We animals, um, my team and I, uh, put out a monthly newsletter about stories we're sharing, uh, victories in the animal rights movement. So if you'd like to sign up, uh, that newsletter will be uh, going around. Um, I brought just a few of my books, and I would love to sell them here and not bring them back to Copenhagen with me. Uh, so after this, I'll be in the art room. I have about 10 books captive in We Animals. If you'd like to buy one, come see me. And what else do we have here? Uh, the film, Kladki, is playing at 5.30 in the Friends room, and uh, it's going to be spectacular. So I hope that you will all come out and see this uh, fantastic new film. I would like to dedicate this presentation to Ron, a chimpanzee who actually graces the cover of the We Animals book. I'll tell you his story at the end of the presentation, but he is a chimpanzee who really changed me. He lived in a five foot by five foot by seven foot cage, suspended above the ground for about 30 years before his rescue. So I'll finish the presentation with his story. I photograph the invisible animals, as I call them. These are the animals in this world we don't want to see, and yet we have a very close relationship with them. We wear them, we eat them, we use medicine that's tested on them, and we use them in entertainment, and yet we fail to see them in our lives. If we consider them at all, it's often as a part instead of a whole. We think of them as wings instead of chickens. We think of them as fur trim instead of a fox or a mink or a raccoon dog. Sometimes these invisible animals are in plain sight right in front of us, uh, whether they're at rodeos, bullfights, horse races, aquariums, or zoos. With everything that I'm trying to do with this We Animals project is to get us to look and to not turn away. And so you'll often see this simple ask accompanying my images, please don't turn away. And it took me a while for, for me to learn this, but um, you know, I thought people would look at these images and be incensed as I was and would make changes in their lives, but I learned that they don't. People need some hand-holding, and so I try, no, I no longer just you know, paralyze people with these images of cruelty. I try and show them alternatives. Um, I think that people don't want to look at these images, not because they're jerks, but because they're compassionate. I think we're innately compassionate, and so this is very difficult for us. And it's a double whammy because to ask people to confront this kind of cruelty is to ask us to, uh, you know, it turns the lens inward and it asks us to confront our complicity in this cruelty and that's a very hard thing to do. People don't want to do that. And so I do balance the bad with the good. The stories of sanctuary and rescue, this is Large Marge, she lives at Farm Sanctuary. People need to see the individuals in these conditions as well as in these conditions. So whether you're campaigning for vegetarian and veganism, like Prince is here, eat your vegetables, or whether you're showing stories of before and after. This is a capuchin in the cage he lived in. This is after. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> Maybe I love those animals. Anyway, um, we need to show the good and the bad, and you'll see that balance throughout my work. This is Kenny. He makes it into all of my presentations, of course. And uh, he lives at Edgar's Mission. And I want you to commit this uh, very simple motto to memory. It's the Edgar's Mission motto. It's, if we could live happy and healthy lives without harming others, why wouldn't we? I think it's really hard to argue with that. For the photographers, the filmmakers in the room, Take a step back, um, reframe, as you often should and as I often do, about the role that our photos have in this movement. Images shape history. You'll recognize a lot of these images as change makers. Images create empathy and they hold us accountable. This is Gordon, a runaway slave. The image was taken in 1863. 
And this was the first image that was widely published of the physical effects of slavery across the USA. And this so published in newspapers around the USA. And this is an image that galvanized the country. And it was one of the pieces of the puzzle that helped to end slavery. So that's what we're doing with our work. Our work is very, very important. I want you all to give your films and your photos the treatment uh, and care that they deserve because they are historical. Our work is going to be on museum walls someday and in books showing what was once and what should never again be. Images are proof. Um, how are we to know that the inside of a transport truck looks like this unless we go to look to bear witness and, and to take photographs? Captain Paul Watson famously said that the camera is uh, the most powerful tool in the world, powerful weapon in the world, and I, of course, agree as, be, as a photographer. And something else for the photographers and filmmakers. Um, please be a part of the photo world, not just the animal rights photo world. Um, I've been a professional photographer for almost 20 years now. So before I was doing AR work, I was in the photojournalism world learning that way. Uh, scrutinize the masters. Um, you know, set your bar really, really high. For me, the masters in photojournalism are the Magnum and Seven Agencies, the winners of the World Press Photo. It's really important to look at not what we're doing, but what the others are doing, and analyze images. And you really fall in love with images as well, and that's a nice side effect. Um, analyze what makes them strong, why they're winning all the big prizes, and then emulate them. Look at lighting, look at composition, show your work to others, edit, uh, edit voraciously and um, with great fervor. Basically, you know, if you're going to take a thousand images, quite often you're going to get three or four that are good images. We have to be really strict with ourselves when it comes to editing. And also to detach yourself from your own images. I can't tell you how many times I've been in an incredible situation, something unfolding in front of me. I took 100 images, and I didn't quite get it. And so that's also why it's important uh, to detach yourself from the images and your intention, because sometimes you just don't get the image you want. So set your bar high. AR photography shouldn't, shouldn't be the bar. Uh, the bar should be New York Times and what all of the big newspapers around the world are publishing, because that's where we want our images, right? We want our images and our stories in these publications. Uh, just uh, one last note on that. Uh, attend photojournalism conferences. There are several in, in uh, Europe. I was at one just last week in Germany. And this was a wildlife photography conference, which is, you know, that's not what I do. But I was able to uh, be very humbled by the excellent work that they're doing and to remind myself that I had to have to keep pushing in terms of quality. I've been shooting for almost 20 years, and I'm still learning how to take better and better pictures. So here's a list of a couple of, um, a couple of festivals that you might want to attend and uh, broaden, broaden your horizons in photography. Mentorship. Mentorship. Uh, if you are a photographer, mentor others. I do a lot of mentoring, and that's my email address down here. If you want to reach me, if you have questions about photography, it's really important for us to um, get people excited about animal rights photography, um, teach them however you can, give them advice. And if you are a new photographer, seek out mentors. These, um, these stories that I, that I tell are often the stories of us. Um, and that's what, in part, gets people interested in animal rights work and in the animal stories. This is the Sweetwater, uh, sorry, the Rattlesnake Sweetwater Roundup in Texas. And I shot this story because, you know, I want to expose what happens to snakes there. What they do is they round them up by the thousands. They put them in pits. You can uh, cut their heads off yourself. You can put your hands in their blood and, you know, make, you know, do this and sign your name next to it. It's pretty incredible. I mean, there's no way we should be treating animals this way. But this story was published in National Geographic Voices and in all sorts of places because it's about us as well. It's, this is a festival that people go, you know, to have fun. And we're endlessly curious about ourselves. So that's a really big part of the equation when we want to tell the stories of animals. People are curious about, about why someone like Jenny McQueen would put herself in harm's way for animals. So that's a story as well. Sometimes there are no animals in my images. Uh, except for the human ones. This is Jose Valle uh, with Animal Equality, and people are always really curious about we investigators and, and what we're doing and how we do it, so tell their stories as well. 
And um, it's really important to show people taking positive action in images because we see ourselves in the images of others. Uh, it's the same thing with movies, you know, the characters are relatable. If you have heartbreak, then all of a sudden all the songs on the radio are about your heartbreak. So, you know, things become really relatable. So show people, show positive action. Uh, we Animals is, is very much a sociological study of why we behave the way we do and how we fail to think critically time and time again when it comes to animals. This is, the, um, this is a festival in Toronto, my hometown. It's called Wolfstock, and it's a great place. People come by the thousands. Uh, they bring their animals, but they have this ridiculous thing called the Stupid Dog Trick Contest. And, oh, I need to read from my book. And it's not here. <laughs> I wonder if someone can grab the captive book. Thank you. It's in the, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I knew I forgot something. Um, yeah, so this is the stupid dog trick contest. And it is an example of how we fail to think critically. The animal is the center of everything, and yet we are, you know, just eating what we're fed and doing what we're told and laughing at the stupid dog trick, which is him putting his dog's entire head in his mouth. Yeah. And so here we are, and you know, I, I got up on stage, and, and I got up on stage to take this picture because I wanted to show the animal at the center of everything, but I also wanted to show our ridiculous reactions, you know, failing to think critically once again. And that's what I photographed time and time again at zoos and aquaria, our strange behavior where the animal is the center of everything, and yet we don't see them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, I mean, just to belabor this a little bit, what we often see and what we are shown is the surface of things, and we tend not to look deeper in society, but we also fail to do so as photographers. So I encourage people to, you know, when you think you have the image, stay longer, dig deeper, you're going to get a different story. So here is Luke performing, and, you know, that's an image, that's, that's one image we can present, but what is Luke's life like when he's not performing? Well, this is behind the scenes. He's chained up. He's swaying back and forth. He's alone, being transported from city to city. And how interesting that there are those three women and their babies and the strollers totally, literally ignoring the elephant in the room. So Animals are Hidden in Plain View is the subject of my, my current book, Captive. I made Captive because it's timely. That's another thing we should do as photographers is um, do work, like seize a moment. And the moment right now is this fact that um, the ethics of captivity is widely discussed now thanks to films like Blackfish, uh, due to the tragic shooting death of Harambe the gorilla, uh, due to the cull of Marius the giraffe in, uh, in Copenhagen. And so I had an opportunity to shoot with the Born Free Foundation and I thought, okay, well, I'll do this, but I'll make a book out of it as well as a way of contributing to this mainstream conversation about conservation. So this is the new book. This is one of my favorite images from the book because it illustrates everything I'm trying to say. It's, it's a commentary on our behavior, how we fail to see the animal, how animals are often a representative of a species, and yet we fail to see the suffering of the individual who's right in front of us. What you can't see in this image is, um, is what you can't hear, actually. It's the music. The music was so loud right next to this Baltic gray seal that everyone was leaving the area and going to the other side of the zoo because it was just so loud and this animal couldn't leave. But no, I don't think anyone was thinking about that. They were just thinking about their own welfare. Something else I like about this image is that ridiculous lifesaver floating there. So we take animals and we just, we just put them so far away from home. And I try, I, well, I, I, I go and I seek out these, these situations and I photograph them. But there's a lot that I cannot photograph when it comes to the zooed animals. And I'd like to read you a brief excerpt from the book about that. <laughs> Let me say a few words. Is that too loud? Let me say a few words about the pictures that aren't in this book. Ironically, these are perhaps the worst a zoo has to offer. My photos can't distinguish which animals were caught in the wild and transported overseas. Recent examples include 14 wild elephants from Swaziland transported to zoos in the U.S. and sharks removed from the Atlantic Ocean who now swim in circles in a tiny aquarium in Canada. 
Furthermore, I can't show how those animals were caught in the wild, taken from their mothers or family groups. I have no images of the animals who did not survive the journey to the zoo. I wasn't around to capture the, moments that an, the moment that an animal arrived to spend his or her life in that completely alien and alienating environment. Likewise, I can neither display nor hide the behaviors of these animals who would show, um, uh, the animals would have shown in the wild, hunting, roaming, natural habitats for miles each day, choosing their own companions or forming their own families. I can't photograph how the animals are kept in smaller cages as surplus behind the walls where only authorized staff are granted entry. I can't photograph what we've taken from them or the accidental deaths. All of these remain literally and metaphorically beyond my reach as a photographer. But sometimes we can piece together the stories of these animals. This is Kiska, and we know a little bit about her past. She was wild caught off the coast of Iceland in 1979. She was caught with four other orcas, and they all died. She was brought to the Friendship Cove at Marine Land in Canada. She was inseminated five times, and she gave birth five times, and her babies died. And so she's been basically swimming alone in this tank um, for almost 40 years now. And it takes her one minute to circumnavigate that tank. We suffer from cognitive dissonance, defined as the inconsistency between one's beliefs and one's actions. I took this photo with animal equality, and he's my poster boy, the poor kid, for cognitive dissonance. He was training to be a matador, and I asked him, why do you want to be a bullfighter when you grow up? And he said, because I love bulls. And so we love animals, and we want to see them. So we put them in captivity. We want to see them because we have what uh, Mark Beckoff coined wildlife deficit disorder. And so we do perverted things in order to be near them, like taking a Humboldt penguin and putting them alone in a mall in Thailand. And we want to be near dolphins, and so we do terrible things like put them in these sleazy lagoon-type places so that we can swim with them, and the swim with dolphins industry is worldwide. This picture breaks my heart particularly because you can see the dolphins' rightful home just on the other side of that hotel. Uh, I'd like to read you one last excerpt from the captive book. Like all animals, we wish for autonomy. We wish to be our own. We wish, we wish to be with our own and to explore our world. We flee from harm and we seek shelter. We desire to build our lives and to make our own way. We hate forced, in, forced confinement and we succumb to despair if we have no prospect of freedom. I'm not an ethologist or a psychic. I have no special insight into the souls of animals. And yet I see what I see, and I record it with my camera. And I know that I'm not alone. If you worry that you're being tricked into an anthropomorphism that you don't agree with, then I simply ask you to look again. Do you really think the despondency and desperation we observe are not real? Do we really believe that the paw reaching through the bars, or the defeated body sprawled on the concrete floor, offer no insight into what these beings are experiencing? Where else do these primary emotions come from, if not from our mutual experience as vulnerable animals, subject to the joys and suffering of a body that lives and dies? The zoos I have visited and have depicted in captive are not immutable or inevitable. They are human constructs for human pleasures that belong to an age when we knew little, uh, little to nothing about the inner lives of animals. As the field of ethology continues to gain its footing in the scientific discourse about sentience and welfare, it will become inevitable that compassionate choices are the only path forward. We can encourage zoos to conserve species in the wild, like they do with the Detroit Zoo with the gorillas in the DRC. We can provide more resources for improved habitats for rescued animals who would not survive in the wild. We can close down all unaccredited and poorly run institutions. There are a lot of things we can do. And of this I am certain. Places of exploitation, domination, and objectification have no place in an enlightened society. They can become sanctuaries 
wildlife centers, and places for compassionate conservation. It's time for us to be courageous and build a relationship between we animals and those animals based on respect and care. It's time to evolve and leave captivity behind. I'm seeing a lot of change worldwide, which is great. Zoos are in the spotlight, and they know it, and they know it's time for reform. Uh, leading examples are the Detroit Zoo in the U.S. and uh, the zoo in Poznan, Poland, who recently um, housed uh, two rescued foxes. So photos are important, and some of them speak for themselves, and some of them need a little bit of text and storytelling to tease out the meaning and the story. Um, here are a few examples of images that do speak for themselves, and quite often my most successful images in this regard are those which I photographed with a wide-angle lens. I give workshops in photography, and I think people are often looking for really technical uh, descriptions, but usually my main, my main point is just to get down and to get close and to have some patience, and this is the case here. The photo speaks for itself. Same thing, you can see the entire story. You see exactly what's happening. She's 20 minutes, uh, she's 20 minutes old, still wet from birth, and you can see where she's going. And it's the same thing with this image. It's a relatively wide angle, and we can't fail but empathize with this animal. And then some images need a little bit of storytelling. And here's a wonderful contrast to the previous zoo image. Uh, this is at a sanctuary, and sanctuary, sanctuaries are for animals, as we know. Sanctuaries are places where they care so much about each individual that they will even make a, a wheelchair for uh, a chicken. And this is a rather ordinary image. It's a dog in a car, no big deal. But what becomes extraordinary about this image is the story behind it. Abby, the dog, was born and raised in a lab. She was uh, used for one year out of vet school before she was retired. Um, so she is in her first car, she's with her first family, and she's going to her forever home. And this is Dino, isn't he handsome? <laughs> He was kept in a basement in New York City. They were just raising him for meat, and they saw that he had such a wonderful personality that they couldn't bear to kill him. So they sent him to Farm Sanctuary, where he became head of the herd. <laughs> and this is Pepsi. Uh, he it was also used in research, but he lives now at Save the Chimps in Fort Pierce, Florida. He is unique not only for those incredible golden eyes, but because he has a foot fetish. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like us, totally quirky. <laughs> and I was being toured around the sanctuary, and Dr. Noon, the founder, saw that he was noticing me, and he started pointing at my feet and panting the chimpanzee. <laughs> and and uh, she said, oh, he wants to see your feet. Just show him your feet. You know, we do, what, we do what we can for them. They've been in a cage for 30 years. Show him your feet. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> So part of our job as photographers is to show the individuals amidst the billions. It's really important to use the numbers, to talk about the numbers, and to show them. And yet, of course, we can't feel a billion. But we know that a billion is not a billion. A billion is one plus one plus one. And so when you get close and remove the anonymity of those you photograph, you individual the masses. And I know that's what we're all trying to do here, whether we're photographers or campaigners. HSI estimates that 80 billion land animals were raised and killed for food in 2016. And this does not include the fish. Uh, they are too numerous to count, and so we measure them in tons. Uh, we often think of fish in schools of fish or laid out by the hundreds on, on ice. And so showing the numbers is important. This is in Sweden. This is a barn with 2,500 birds. They are not yet full grown, so you can imagine just how much worse, how much, how much more crowded it's going to get in there once they get to be full grown. It's important to show the numbers, but then what I did was I sat down in that filth, and I waited for them to feel comfortable and curious, and they came up to me, and these are the kind of photographs I started getting. Because they are so stressed out in that environment, they peck each other, and they injure each other. And this is the kind of thing you see, these poor individuals suffering like this. 
individual images are important, but so are photo essays. And I strongly recommend writing out your goals before a shoot so that you don't go in just shooting whatever you can and then trying to piece it together afterwards. And Jan mentioned that in his presentation yesterday. So storyboard, write out your goals, write out the fact, you know, maybe you want to start with some wide angles, you want to show the people involved, you want to show the individuals, the conditions, so that you have something to work with, so that you have a narrative when you come home. I'd like to share with you some of the um, photo essays that I've done over the years. This is a story called Rachel's Promise. I know some of you have heard this once or twice. I, can't, I can never get this story out of my presentations, though. I just love telling it. Uh, Rachel is a young woman from the UK who went to volunteer for three months in Cameroon uh, at Ape Action Africa. But she saw that it was quite poorly run. And three months turned into six months. And then it turned into a year. And they were taking in far too many uh, animals who had been rescued from the bushmeat trade. She had tons of just little baby gorillas that she was raising, that she was rescuing. And so her promise to these gorillas, specifically this group of gorillas, was that she would not rest until she could find, she could build them a proper sanctuary home. Gorillas are quite sensitive, very different from chimpanzees. They need a lot of privacy. Um, it's very easy for them to get human-born illnesses when they're too close to a village, which is the case here. So my trip to Cameroon coincided with uh, her fulfillment of this promise to the gorillas. And so I got to photograph her the day before they moved to the big space. And that's what you're seeing here. She's raised them all. It was really quite special uh, to witness her relationship with them. That's Shay. He's eight years old. He's definitely too big to be on his mom's back. And I just love that he's holding her boob. <laughs> <laughs> the following day, they had to sedate each gorilla one by one, and Rachel was a typical worried mama. Each gorilla one by one went to the vet clinic where they got individual care, vaccinations, teeth checked to make sure they were okay for the move. And then one by one, they were brought into the car to the new enclosure. Now, never get in a car with a gorilla. It's a very, very bad idea. <laughs> Pickin on the right was asleep, and there I was taking pictures, which I was so excited about doing. And then she woke up, and I became very, very nervous. <laughs> but because she was in the arms of her caretaker, Apollinaire, she stayed calm, thank goodness. Rachel was at the other end in the satellite cage, uh, which is attached to the 200-acre space. And she made sure that they all woke up in her arms so that they wouldn't be afraid. She spent 48 hours in that satellite cage satellite cage, and then it was time to open the doors and see what happened. She didn't know if they would be too afraid to go outside, but to her great pleasure, they did, one by one by one, after the door was open. And this is when photographing became really difficult, because the gorillas started running off into the 200-acre space, and then she's chasing them from the outside, and I'm chasing her, trying to get a decent picture. And then she stopped and she had a cry. And she threw up her hands and said, OK, God, you can take me now. I'll die happy. But she did not die, of course. Uh, she's still there 15 years later. And uh, she's the caretaker of about 400 primates. Uh, if any of you ever want to volunteer with primates, it's a really, really wonderful, special place. It's called Ape Action Africa in Cameroon. Now we are in Asia with the Animals Asia Foundation. I'd like to tell you about bears and bear bile farming. This is Mara. She's just been rescued from a bear bile farm. She's like, it's cool. I'm cool here in my hammock. So why do bears need rescuing? Uh, maybe some of you know this, but there is an industry called uh, well, it's bear bile farming. They keep animals in cages like this and much smaller. And they tap their gallbladder for bile, which is used in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, this bile does has anti-inflammatory properties, but of course there are a lot of ways we can, you know, you, we can get medicines like that. So there's absolutely no need to keep animals in places like these. Things are changing and things are changing quickly. Finally, provinces throughout Southeast Asia and China are committing to ending bear bile farming and there are really good groups who are rescuing the animals as well. Uh, this is the rescue of a bear named Miracle. She was put in this cage as a cub eight years before this picture was taken. And this is her, her rescue underway. This illustrates where she spent her entire life. And the background is where she will spend the rest of her life, which is that new sanctuary home in Vietnam. 
So they had to sedate her to get her out of the cage as well. And what you're seeing on her forehead are calluses from rubbing her head back and forth against the bars and depression and despair for her whole life. And you can see the terrible condition her paws are in. But it was just so moving and beautiful to see how gently they treated her after a life like that. They put her out onto the stretcher and brought her to the operating room. All the bears go to the operating room because they often have to have parts, metal parts, removed from their abdomens. Uh, they often get teeth removed because the nerves are exposed from biting on the bars their entire lives. You can see the bar line right here and the condition her nails are in, but she had the best treatment, as they all do, at this sanctuary, and I had the great pleasure of meeting her again three years later. And, you know, she came in at a very, very traumatized bear, but she recovered quickly, and I was told, and I observed, that she ate the most, stayed out the latest, and had the most friends. <laughs> So, of course, these animals can't be uh, rewilded. Uh, they wouldn't be able to fend for themselves. So this, these kind of large enclosures where they have lots of enrichment are, is the best option for them. Uh, they get toys to play with. They get to you know, sit around and pose for my pictures and just do nothing. <laughs> I love that picture so much. It's so sweet. This is a sun bear. This is also a sun bear. Now, this picture is lying to you. This is not a bear in a bear ball farm. This is a rescued bear. And I don't know his name, but I do know his story. He spent the first four years of his life in a crush cage. You can imagine what that is. And when he started producing lower quality bile, they further abused his body by cutting off his front paws for bear paw soup, which is still a delicacy in Vietnam. But he survived. He survived this and he was rescued by Free the Bears. And this is where I took this picture of him in Cambodia. And though he had a whole sanctuary within which to roam around with his friends, he chose to stay indoors because he wanted the company of humans, interestingly. And so in this picture, he's looking awfully depressed, but he's actually just begging for his favorite treat, which is pineapple jam. And uh, I was taking this picture, and I was getting closer and closer to the cage, which I shouldn't have done. No one was watching me. And I took this picture, but then he grabbed me, and he pulled me against the cage. And these are very strong animals, and he could have bitten me. He could have broken my bones, but he didn't. Uh, he was just playing. But for that moment, that brief moment, I was in a bear hug, and I was being held by his stumps. And it's animals like him who remind me every single day of the fight that I fight and why I fight it. If these animals can be so forgiving with us, such sentient, beautiful animals, we deserve to give them everything that we can. There are all sorts of antidotes to these, these problems we are causing for animals. And one of them is acknowledging the overlap of oppressions and working in solidarity with others to improve the lives of all. Uh, someone gave a great talk yesterday about intersectionality, and that's what I'm talking about here. AR does not exist in a bubble, and we shouldn't treat it as such. Animal abuse intersects uh, with labor violations and human rights. This is at a factory farm where the workers asked all of us if we could help them get other jobs in other countries because they did not want to be doing the painful, underpaid job that they were doing. Animal abuse intersects with environmental abuse. This is outside of a mink farm in Canada. The runoff is causing an algae bloom in waterways that completely destroys the water and makes the water inhabitable, makes the entire area inhabitable. Fantastic quote here by Melanie Joy. Progressive social change requires not simply liberating specific groups, but challenging the foundations of oppression itself. And I could not agree more. And so I photograph people doing all sorts of fantastic intersectional work, like Cora Bailey at the community-led animal welfare in South Africa, uh, Johannesburg. Our story starts here at the Rand Fountain dump in one of the townships. So this is the municipal dump where 400 people live with animals. And this place is so dangerous that even the police don't go there, but uh, she didn't tell me that. She didn't tell me that until afterwards. She knows I wouldn't have gone. Uh, but she's welcome there because she helps the people and she helps animals. So she's, she's always welcome with smiles. Uh, here we are. Oh, yeah. So in this picture, there's uh, people farm. They have, they have pets. They farm. And so she's picked up a runt who is half dead. And she's going to take this animal for treatment. And now we're walking around looking for animals who need help. Uh, she's got a puppy there. And that's her foster son, Moses, who's helping, uh, helping us find people and find animals, and Moses has picked up a really sick dog who also went into the ambulance. 
people, um, people come, but once a month she brings the ambulance there so that she can give medical care to, um, to the animals. And so that's what you're seeing here. It's the staff and the volunteers and the kids who are bringing their dogs for vaccinations. And it's, it's all quite lovely. Uh, that dog, that, that pig, can you see the pig? <laughs> That's her. Um, she was rescued that day, and she's now 400 pounds. And she was named after me. <laughs> her name's Jojo. <laughs> Makes me very happy. <laughs> but um, she's one of the many people I've met who knows that if you want to help, help animals, you have to help people as well. I do think the future is getting brighter for animals. I see that every day in all the work that I do. I see that in the feedback I get from my work. I see it at places like this. We're in a room full of really compassionate, motivated people. And this is actually the focus of my next big project called Unbound, which is underway. And Unbound focuses on women in the animal rights movement, women at the front lines of animal advocacy. Uh, what I noticed everywhere I went was that quite often there was a man at the head of an organization, but it was women who were doing the work. And this is proven historically in, in the UK and in North America. The movement has always been made up of 60 to 80 percent women. And so this project celebrates that. And I'd like to introduce you to some of these wonderful women that we're featuring. We have famous women like Dr. Jane Goodall, but then we, we have a, we're making a point of featuring people who just do tireless, thankless work uh, out, out of the spotlight, like Lumka Golintete here. She's a first responder. She gets up at 3 in the morning. She takes those phone calls and goes out to, uh, to help animals who've been hit by cars and that kind of thing. She's tireless. We're featuring women in science, such, such as neurologist Aisha Akhtar who specializes in preventative medicine. And her goal always is to, whatever she's doing, she wants to help get animals out of labs. How many of you know Patty Mark? Patty Mark in Australia. Uh, she uh, created this concept of open rescues, which happened to this day. Um, she is about 65 years old, and she's still chaining herself to the inside of factory farms to raise awareness and make factory farms visible. And um, this project features historical women, not just contemporary women. This is Fanny Martin, and I have a, a few notes on her. She was fabulous. A lot of the time, these women uh, historically aren't even known by their, their first names. They're known as, like, for, for example, her husband's name. So she would have been Madame Claude Martin. So Fanny Martin uh, lived, was married to, uh, to Claude Bernard in the late 1800s. And she was just galled that her dowry was paid to him to do his vivisection work. He was a famous vivisector, but she was an animal lover. And she was quite brave. Uh, she actually, uh, in, in opposition to her husband's work, she started a rescue home for animals. And she protested outside of his office with her daughter and other women. <laughs> Um, she was, even though she was Catholic, she did separate from him in 1870, which is also quite courageous. So she totally defied the predominant powers of the time and the predominant uh, conventions. She's a very courageous woman. Now, there's very little information about her, but in one of the texts about her husband, uh, this is quoted about her. She was referred to as an uneducated woman who made her husband's life a living hell. <laughs> <laughs> We feature politicians like Marianne Timi. I'm sure you, a lot of you know her. She's made a lot of change. She's the um, founder of the Dutch Party for Animals. We feature women like Anita Kreintz, who has been recently made quite famous as the woman uh, being charged for giving water to thirsty pigs. So women who are driven by a great sense of urgency. Women like Dobruja, Do hi, <laughs> who is the co-founder of this conference and the co-founder of Otvate Klatki as well. So we've just done a story about her. We're featuring women entering the growing field of animal law, young trailblazers like Al Avalon Tyson. She was 14 years old when she spoke at COP21 about the connections between climate change and factory farming. She's incredible. I'm running out of town, so I, time, so I can't go into all these stories. But we feature innovative, innovative veterinarians like Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikuzoka. She's our next, our next story. She's from Uganda. Uh, philosophers and um, activists of all kinds, like Elisa Altola, who is from Finland. Oh yeah, about this. You can, you can nominate women. I encourage you all to do so. We have lots and lots of nominations already. But there is the link to our website. I'm going to project unboundproject.org backslash nominate. We'd love to hear from you about women you would like to have featured in the project. 
And we feature women like Rabia Hawa, a real trailblazer. She's the first female Muslim ranger with the Kenyan Wildlife Services. And tenacious women like Dr. Theo Capaldo, who's been doing this for decades. She does anti-vivisection work. And I just love this quote by her. It's all the same, really. The environment, women, children, civil rights, the animals, it's all about the same thing, compassion and doing what's right for everyone. A few more photo tips. Um, this is a mistake we all make in supplies to campaigns and to photographers. Hire people, like, put this in your budget, hire people who are professionals to do PR and marketing for the work that you're putting out because we are simply not experts at doing that and it's a really good investment. If you're gonna put all your time into making this work, it needs to be seen as widely as possible. So I encourage you to hire PR as I have done for my books. Uh, the reason Captive was in National Geographic Voices, was covered in Guardian and Washington Post is because I had someone working on that. And here's a lovely graph for you. The one on the left is what people think a photographer's life is, taking pictures, uh, partying like rock stars, traveling to exotic locations, where the pie chart on the right is, is quite accurate. Um, you know, we are basically at our desks doing social media, doing marketing, building websites, editing, that kind of thing. And so if I can belabor that a little bit, if you want to be a successful photographer, you have to spend a lot of time taking really good care of your images. And make your images available to anyone helping animals. Again, that's what I've done here with the We Animals Archive. You can use them for free, uh, get them out there, because of course the last thing you want is to have these images. 10 minutes, great. Last thing you want is to have uh, these images sitting on your hard drive. And because I'm sitting in a room with photographers and a lot of investigators and people working so hard, on behalf of animals, I do want to thank everyone for, for doing that hard, hard work and for bearing witness and for making their lives visible. It really is a crucial part of the animal rights movement. Uh, I will wrap up by sharing Ron's story with you. I used to tell it a different way until, let me find my papers here. I used to tell Ron's story a different way, but then I realized that he and I were exactly the same age. Uh, we were born a few months apart in 1976. And I started thinking about the chronology of our lives based on what we know from his charts. And so when Ron and I were born in 1976, I was nurtured by my mother and loved by my family. But he was, uh, he was quickly turned into either a pet or a performer, we're not sure. But he was taken away from his family. And then he was put in a cage to be used for research for the rest of his life. When Ron and I were eight years old, I was the one out climbing trees. But he was in a five foot by five foot by seven foot cage, suspended above the ground. In our late teens, Ron and I were both in a university setting. I was studying of my own free will, and of course he was there being used still for research. The charts are sketchy, but they do say that during this time he was once darted 16 times in a five week period. Darted meaning sedated for research. When Ron and I were 22 years old, I went off to have an adventure in the Amazon jungle and he was part of a spinal dynamic study where a disc in his neck was removed. And following the invasive surgery on his spine, he was not given pain medication for eight days, and that pain medication was two Tylenol. When, when Ron and I were 26, mercifully, he was rescued by Save the Chimps, and that's where I took this picture of him. And like that bear I introduced you to earlier who just wanted to stay with humans, that was Ron, that's what Ron, that is what Ron wanted as well. He had five acres to roam around with his friends, but he chose to stay indoors every day and form this nest, because that's where he felt safest. And that's also where he died not too long ago, in that nest, peacefully but prematurely, which is a fate common for chimpanzees used in research. Um, and now with this very last paragraph about Ron. Ron's inherent dignity his individuality and the gravity of his gaze are shared by many, if not all of the animals you've met today. It's my hope that, after what Ron and the other beings whom you've encountered in We Animals have undergone and continue to undergo, that we're up to the task of doing the right thing by them and by our conscience. At the very least, we owe Ron and all the others the respect of meeting their eyes and not turning away. So 
so with that, I thank you all for meeting their eyes and for looking and for seeing and for not turning away. Thank you.